good. Well, we are recording, so why don't we go ahead and get started. So again, welcome. My name is Stan Myers. Uh, I am the president of the Casey Downtowners, and we're so happy you all are joining us here for the lunch hour. Um, uh, I'm also a client development manager for Terracon. We're an engineering firm here in Kansas City. We have offices across the country, but our headquarters are right here uh, in Kansas City. Um, for those of you uh, joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. We're so excited. And uh, Casey Downtowners, we are an informal association of Kansas Cityans who gather to network, socialize, and share our common passion for downtown and the urban core. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited today because we have a topic that really just hits that right on the head. Uh, we're going to talk about a downtown a building that's on the National Historic Register uh, that has been renovated, that is on the streetcar line, and it's going to be a great story. But before we get going, first, let me uh, invite everyone to participate in a survey. And Sydney Goldberg, a fellow board member, is going to put that link in the chat. Uh, you may have already seen it, perhaps even responded to it. Uh, it's on our website and was on the e-blast uh, with the registration for this particular meeting. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few moments to, to, to look that over, it's like a five minute survey. It will help us, especially as we kind of begin the transition from you know Zoom, hybrid, in person. This is these are the things that we're that we're looking at doing here here very soon. So again, um, if Sydney, do you have that in the chat? I'm told that my sound is bad. All right, let me mute and unmute. And hopefully that helps. Thank you for letting me know that, Kate. It could just be me that sounds bad. So anyway, well, uh, one of the things that we have been doing since uh, COVID and going into the Zoom format is that every month at our virtual luncheon, uh, in lieu of the fact that we're uh, not getting together in person, and typically we have a you know a, a uh, modest registration fee, twenty five dollars to join us for for lunch, we ask people to consider uh, donating to a nonprofit. And this month, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Starla Wolf Brennan from Amethyst Place. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you right now. I know you're on a timeline, and tell us a little bit about the, the Amethyst. Sure, thank you for having me. Um, Amethyst, we are just uh, up the street. We're at 28th and Troost, and we have a campus of six different apartment buildings. Um, we were started in the year 2000. We're a little over 20 years old, and it was in response to the high recurrence rate of substance, substance use among mothers who left a treatment program, um, and they discovered they just need more support. And so um, Amethyst Place came into being. Our noble cause is to inspire generational healing and empower generations of women and children to achieve recovery, reunification, and resilience. Um, our moms that come here, they're generally early 30s. They have three to four children. Um, thank you, Kim, for putting our, our website in the chat. Um, most of our moms don't have a high school education. They all have been diagnosed with substance use disorder and most have a co-occurring mental health disorder as well. They, in order to be referred here, they are they have to be homeless. Um, most of them have had their children taken away from them. So their kids are in foster care or they're with extended relatives. Mm -hmm. um, they have been subject to all sorts of trauma uh, that you can imagine. Most have been in generational uh, situations of poverty and substance use and trauma. So they have a, a lot of hurdles in front of them when they come. The best thing for a mom in recovery is to get reunified with her kids. And so we of course really focus on that. Our stats last year, we actually had 100% reunification rate in her first 60 days here. So that, that has a lot to do with the amethyst reputation. We advocate in the courts for the moms. 
the judges know our program and they know that we are wraparound services for the mom and the kids, that two generation approach. And so that makes a difference. And they're more inclined to allow the mom to be reunified with the children earlier because they know that, that the mom's getting so much support here. Um, about, you know, of course, kids having uh, suffered trauma as well. <laughs> um, they, have, they have issues, about 80% of them have low reading levels and learning disabilities. About 20% of them have been di have diagnosed mental health disorders. So that's why um, it's just so important to have that two generational approach. So we have an adult therapist, but we also have a child therapist. We do family therapy. Um, our goals here, number one, to house this family who is experiencing homelessness, to reunite the moms and kids, and then to help mom with her, her recovery, um, to help mom and kids heal from that trauma. And then we are all about getting that family so that they can sustain their togetherness and their lifestyle. And so we really focus on increasing income and helping the mom do whatever she needs to that sh so that she can you know, cover all the costs and, um, and really have changed the complete trajectory of her family. So we focus on education, like that is a huge part of our program. Number one, getting the GED, um, but also college education. I mean, we have Casey Scholars, Casey Block Scholars. Um, we, we really focus on that because we know the only way out of generational poverty is to increase your income. So <laughs> you can throw a lot of things at it, but at the end of the day, when an agency exits, you know, helping a family, the only way that mom is going to sustain that is if she's able to earn more income. And the main way to do that is to get more um, certification, equip her in ways to um, increase her education and her skills. So we have 37 apartment, we have 39 apartments, we use two for offices. Those 37 families, uh, we have 37 moms, but then we'll have, you know, 80 kids or so on campus. Over half are under five. So we have, <laughs> we have a lot of kids on campus. It's a lot of fun to watch all the little three-year-olds run around and play. Um, once the kids get here, they, they heal much faster than mom. Um, because they're younger and they're back with mom and they have this beautiful campus. They get to learn how to play with other kids, how to have a stable house. Um, it's, it's incredible to watch, to watch those kids heal so quickly. So we provide housing, um, we have pantry, uh, we bring on, bring in dental, medical help, those kinds of things. And then we do family empowerment. So that's where you get into the education, um, we do life skills classes, the court advocacy, um, we have a wellness coach. And so she's focusing on nutrition and, uh, physical exercise. <laughs> when people stop using a lot of times they'll start something else. So they'll, they'll eat the wrong things or too much of things. Um, and so that's really to get that holistic view uh, we did add that position a year ago and it's really made such a difference for our moms. And then we have the financial coaching. Um, we have a, a coach just dedicated to financial literacy. And, um, you know, we do tutoring for the moms and the kids. Um, and then we have an employment program called 100 Jobs for 100 Moms. And this is a supported employment program. The employers know that this mom may need extra help. She's provided with a mentor. We provide extra support here on campus, but you know, she develops this great work history and learns how to work in some of these different situations. So um, that's been fantastic. And then our therapeutic support services, and that's with the, the adult therapy, the child therapy. Um, lots of parent education. We do monthly art club. Um, so we, we have, we have a ton of stuff going on <laughs> campus all the time. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, and, you know, and it makes a difference. I mean, like I said, 100% of our families were reunited within the first 60 days last year. 
90% of our moms made maintain their recovery even during COVID, which, and in fact, it increased. Um, that's double the national average. And that's because of this community that we have here where they're all in recovery. They're all supporting each other. Their kids are playing together. They're learning how to parent together. Um, and then we had 35 moms engaged in college or vocational programs. That's, that's tremendous. And that number actually increased. You know, they lost their jobs because of COVID, but then they took advantage of going back to school. So it was, it was kind of a, a silver lining uh, with COVID. That was pretty cool. Um, a lot of these moms are first generation students. Uh, so that's kind of us in a nutshell. It's basically if the mom can get here. Uh, you know, we provide all kinds of supports. Our wait list is about a year though. And that mom, and there's no place else like this. And so, you know, you find recovery centers, but they don't allow children. And, or it's a very, you know, you can only stay here for six months or something like that. But we're unlimited. The mom and children can stay here as long as they need to. Um, the year-long wait list is heartbreaking to us. And so we have acquired some land. Our plan is to expand and almost double our size within the next two years. So we're, we're anxiously looking forward to that. Uh, we just submitted an application for some tax credits and hope to receive that, which will then kick off um, construction and doubling our size. So yeah, that's pretty much, pretty much us in a nutshell. Starla, thank you. That, that's a wonderful story. I encourage everyone to go to the website. There are some, some great personal stories uh, written out there. I love the idea that, you know, re reuniting the children with their, their moms. I mean, what, what better medicine than that, right? So mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. for all that you do. I, again, I encourage everyone to go look at the website. Also uh, donate uh, if, if you can. And uh, just, just support in any way possible. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing the story of, of Amethyst Place. Thank you for letting me talk with all of you. Have a great day. Thank you, you too. So, so now I want to introduce Blue Sky Restoration. We have Patrick O'Hare and uh, Allison Jones. Um, you know, we're so grateful uh, to all the wonderful uh, Kansas City uh, companies that uh, are uh, able to, uh, willing to be corporate sponsors for our monthly luncheons. So I will turn it over now to Allison and or Patrick to uh, share with us the Blue Sky story. I did want to say hello. I had to start driving to, like I said, double book. So um, I will um, let Pat introduce Blue Sky, but just wanted to say hello and thank you guys for letting us join and sponsor today's luncheon. All right, so um, thanks for that, Allison. We are uh, a property damage restoration company. We have 37 off 37 ish offices nationwide. Um, we are out of Lenexa. So pretty much in the center of the city. And uh, we offer mold remediation, uh, reconstruction. Uh, we have a commercial roofing department. Um, we do uh, uh, emergency services like water mitigation and fire flood stuff so um, all, all the great all the great things that keep us up at night so um, if anybody ever has a need for anything like that we're definitely happy to help and a phone call away something bad happens in a building we're a good call knock on wood <laughs> Yeah, we do, we definitely don't. Want, yeah, we definitely don't want you to call call us all the time, but uh, we're we're available if you if something ever happens. Well, great. Thank thank you so much for for being our sponsor for for joining us today for sharing the story. Uh, you know, and it, it seems maybe the perfect segue perhaps to our our main topic and uh, with the Flash Cube building. Uh, which was, uh, I believe, I mean, it's a historic building. I, I can't wait to hear the, the history behind it. Uh, I think I read a little bit uh, leading up to this that it had sat vacant for 12 years prior to uh, Worcester communities taking, taking over and, 
and redeveloping this. this. Um, so I, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Haley Irvin, who is the regional manager on the Worcesters community team. Uh, Haley brings years of multifamily property management experience with an emphasis in new development uh, and uh, uh, apartment communities. Uh, blending new and historic, she will share the story of Flash Cube and what all went into the design and architecture of this renovation. And I'll let you introduce members of your team, including the project architect. So Haley, I'll turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Stan. Um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to turn it over to John Waynick first uh, to give us history of the building and architect and design. And then I'll follow that up uh, with just kind of a presentation of, of Flash Cube, just some interior photos and sharing some of our information. Also on the call with us is Victoria Christopher. She's our on-site community manager at Flash Cube. So we are all excited to be here and thank you for inviting us. And uh, John, I'll let you take it away. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Uh, like, Stan, like Haley said, uh, I was the architect on that project uh, at the time with Clockwork. I'm now uh, with Hollis Miller Architects, uh, but uh, that project was done through Clockwork. Uh, and like Stan said, uh, the building did sit vacant uh, for 12. I, I'm not sure the exact number of years, but I had heard anywhere from 10 to 20 years it sat vacant. Uh, really kind of a, a sad sight to be seen when we first got involved in the project. Um, and uh, to see the transformation has been pretty amazing. But you know, early on, uh, a lot of studies, uh, a lot of challenges. It's a, it's a part of downtown that um, you're, you're kind of right on the fringe of downtown. So you almost a little bit forgotten. You're not part of the river market and you're kind of, you're in downtown, but you feel like you're kind of falling off the edge of downtown. So uh, it was, it was clear that once you once we got there that this building was just crying to uh, to be renovated. So uh, spent a lot of time in that building. I you know probably five year over the five year course uh, spent many an hour in that building. But uh, building was designed. Uh, it's a historically significant building because it was one of the very first curtain wall uh, construction buildings designed by H O K out of St. Louis, there's a, another building in St. Louis that is very similar to Flash Cube. Uh, after they built that, they, uh, I think while that was under construction, this one was being designed and then being constructed as well. Um, so it's, it's, what's really fascinating about this building is it's, you know, Stan had touched on the historic nature of this building. Uh, having done a lot of historic projects in my career, uh, this is kind of the new age of, of uh, historic buildings. It's, you know, you, when people think about historic buildings, you often think of these old brick buildings or stone and uh, lots of heavy materials. You don't really think about a glass box. Uh, so that's uh, what's really unique is that we're right on that kind of edge of uh, what is now be, you know, becoming uh, considered historic, you know, for tax credits. So, uh, what's through the whole process, what was been really gratifying is how the National Park Service uses this building and this project as an example of uh, a great way of, you know, utilizing tax credits and, and re, uh, repurposing a historic modern, a modern historic building. So uh, that, that's, that's been really nice. But uh, a quick history, you know, nine story building with a basement, uh, rather unique. You know, it was it was used by Commerce Bank. There were a couple of vaults in the basement. Uh, so that was uh, interesting and challenging at the same time. You know, how do you reuse a vault that has an 18 inch thick concrete wall? Uh, not always the easiest challenge. Uh, some level changes in the basement and then there is, if, if anyone's been to the building, there's a large plaza space out in front. Well, what most people don't realize if you've never visited the building is there's actually a whole space underneath the plaza. Uh, we always refer to it just as the under plaza space, uh, but it's you know about 18 foot story, uh, just a clear space. So during the design, you know, how do you how do you repurpose? this space that was originally a parking garage, well, I think just a parking level, and then um, then was converted into high density storage. 
So uh, very dry space, but not exactly the most inviting space to, uh, to repurpose. So uh, with ownership uh, and the design team and the construction team putting our heads together, came up with some creative ways to really repurpose that space and, and put some windows into that space. So there's a breezeway between the under plaza space and the main building. So if you were ever down there beforehand, you know, there were soffits falling down. Uh, the building had really become deteriorated and decayed, you know, concrete, steel, brick, everything was starting to kind of fall down. It was rather scary. And there was even a large raccoon that used to live in the under plaza space that uh, I never got the joy of, of running across. I don't know if joy is the right word, but um, a number of the people that had been there before had seen this large raccoon that I think had taken ownership of the under plaza. Uh, so uh, to go down there then and to see this space now, uh, opening up some windows into the under plaza space and into the lower level of, uh, of the main building, yeah, it, it it went from what could be, you know, a horror, you know, a horror movie scene to one of the most inviting spaces that you would never really think would be inviting. There's so much light and glass through there. It's it's a fantastic space. So that kind of forgotten under plaza space became a great place to put many of our amenities. So there's a basketball court, there's pickleball courts, a rock climbing wall, which I can't say I've ever done in any of the multifamily buildings that I've ever done, uh, you know, some game space. And it's uh, to go there originally and go there now, you wouldn't even think you're in the same, in the same building. You, you would really feel like somebody was playing a trick on you. Um, and then the rest of the basement, you know, you think that's where the vaults were. Um, really, you know, a lot of mechanical space down there. So you know, how do you repurpose all that space down there? So there's a, a a significant, uh, what was originally a club room, which is kind of club room slash plex pod space, which I'll touch on in a little bit. Uh, so it's a little bit of co-working, a little bit of fun social atmosphere. There's uh, There was a large vault that we converted into a turf room. So there's another thing that I've never done on another multifamily project is, is have a, a large concrete box in essence that has turf in it. And you can just go and kick soccer balls around or, or whatever you want to do in there. So it's rather unique uh, to Flash Cube. And uh, also there's some some good storage space. And we, you know, through the design. So while we had started construction, there was part of the basement that we were still trying to figure out what do we want to do with. Uh, and having a great relationship with the National Park Service, we were able to uh, get some windows approved on the south side. Uh, so there's a space that used to be, there were some servers and it was really kind of a back of house stuff that you would never really ever want windows into. Uh, but now it's office space. So we've added some windows there. It completely transformed that space. It's very inviting. Uh, you would never think that a basement like where we were would be inviting, but it's a, it's a great space, really changes the feel. Um, and then we've, we, re we redid all the, uh, the steam system to the building. So if anybody knows uh, downtown, uh, formerly Veolia, now vicinity, uh, big steam company, uh, they have steam lines all throughout downtown. Well, we had approached them early on because we knew there was steam to the building and worked with them quite a bit over the course of construction and design to uh, bring steam, new steam, so a whole new steam system to the building, re try to re reuse as many of the, the pipes as we could uh, that were in good shape. But then uh, this is actually one of the, probably the largest scale uh, project of its type to where we have steam to a multifamily building. This is something that vicinity was very excited about being a partner in because they hadn't really done it of this scale before. So that was, that was a fun challenge at times, but uh, it turned out to be uh, great in the end, really happy with it. Uh, very energy efficient, which is fantastic. Uh, keep residents' uh, bills, you know, try to minimize those bills as much as we can. Um, so, and then from the lobby, you know, we when you enter the building, it, it was, 
it was like an office building that had been cut up over years and just looked very dated. And one of the goals was we wanted to bring back the feel of what the original Flash Cube, and for those that don't know, the name Flash Cube uh, comes from the old Kodak Flash Cubes uh, way back in the day. So it's been nicknamed the Flash Cube and we, we played around with that a lot through design and construction, but uh, so we wanted to we wanted to bring back that feel of that lobby. It had has mirrored ceiling tiles, uh, just a really kind of early '70s vibe. It, it it's you know I can't tell you how many people questioned the direction to go with uh, to try to bring back that feel. But once we did it, everybody walks in and goes, "This is so cool! Uh, this is just the the neatest lobby. You don't see it very often. It's." You kind of feel like you're in a house of mirrors a little bit, but it's it's pretty fun. It's it's a great space. And then that so that first uh, story space uh, I touched on earlier, uh, Plexpod was a great partner. Came in mid mid construction, and we worked hand in hand with them to build out office space on either side of the the entry lobby, and then some in the basement to where. Um, you know, if anyone's familiar with Plexpod, I'm sure you probably are being down Casey downtowners, but you know, they have uh, office space that people can rent, you know, a, a space and then residents have a Plexpod membership by living at, at Flashcube. So it's a great benefit to residents. Uh, they were a fantastic partner, fun to work with, uh, gave, gave the design team a lot of uh, flexibility to do some fun stuff. It's a great space. There's certainly things in there that I never would have thought of, but our our uh, interiors team came up with some fantastic solutions. So uh, along those lines, there's a dock area that's in the back of the building that it was about the you know second to the basement, uh, about the worst place in the building that you'd really want to go. Two really large dumpsters. That's where all the trash came and went in the building. Well, we converted that into a break room, and it is really cool. We open up the back of the building. There's uh, sliding glass doors. So people like when it's nice out, uh, maybe not like this morning, but uh, you know, nice weather day, you open up those sliding glass doors and you can sit out on the patio. It's, it's beautiful. Great. Especially during these COVID times when you want to get outside a little bit. So it's, it's a great space. And then moving up from the main level um, had the challenge of how can we maximize this footprint and get as many good apartments where we have a good cross section of anywhere from you know really economical studio apartments to a handful of three bedroom apartments. And anybody that knows downtown apartment living, you can't find three bedroom apartments in a downtown urban city setting. It is very hard to find. So it's it's one thing that makes Flash Cube really unique is that we have such a great range of apartment sizes. Uh, it's, it's a great building. Um, I probably rambled on more than I, than I can, but you know, when you spend, you know, five years working on a project, you, you have a lot of, a lot of great memories about the project and, and the building itself. So, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Haley. She can share her uh, slideshow with you. Hey, thank you, John. Yeah, incredible. And you touched on everything that's within the slide. So, so I'll just give a couple visuals here. Um, also, thank you for sharing the FlashCube uh, website link, um, also our address. And yeah, anyone come by, we'd love to give you a tour, show you around. We've got a great team here on site six days a week. Um, so welcome to walk in or schedule an appointment, whichever works for you. But we, we are proud of the project and excited to show it to anyone who's interested. So let me see if I can share my screen here and I will. Just give a couple photos um, here from so Flash Cube. Can everybody hope and everybody can see there? Um, so the exterior of the building, like John mentioned, um, fully glass cube. It's it's quite striking. Um, also very beautiful because it 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 kind of mimics whatever weather is going on outside. Um, so we often see people stop in front of the building and take photos, which we're always excited to see. Um, just some of the redevelopment highlights that John covered. Um, and just kind of that the work that went into it and uh, the overall development, how it turned out, obviously, is just beautiful. 
apartment feature. So the photo here is actually one of our model units and one of the views that you can see there out of the nice big windows. Um, so we do have studio one, two, and three bedroom apartments. Uh, very excited to bring some three bedrooms to the downtown market. Um, not, not a whole lot of those to be found. So uh, we are finding there's definitely a need for that and excited to fulfill that. Um, smart home technology throughout the building and in the homes themselves in the apartments, um, including um, some an app that basically operates everything. You can get into the door, get up the elevator, uh, turn on lights within your home, thermostat, et cetera. All of the apartments come with those full-size washer and dryer, um, and then kind of features within their polished concrete floors, Corian countertops, soft closed cabinets and drawers. So overall, just a beautiful product. Um, John touched on our amenities. We, I'm proud to say we uh, won the Apartment Association of Kansas City Award for best amenities in the area. So we were very excited about that and felt that it was well-deserved. Um, so we do fitness center, a sport court, which includes a basketball court, pickleball court, pet spa, um, a bark park area, turf room, luxury lounge. So really just everything you could possibly want to do um, within your home, just within steps of your front door. So very exciting. Residents really enjoy it. PlexPod members also um, enjoy the amenity space. So that partnership has been wonderful um, with PlexPod. Um, this little slide here shows kind of a of one of the PlexPod areas that John mentioned with the sliding door, which is not shown here in this photo, but kind of right behind and you're looking in from the door. Um, so this is a great partnership with PlexPod. Wonderful for our residents um, to have that membership when they become a FlashCube resident and then also for PlexPod members to have the perk of using all of the amenity spaces. Um, so we're very, very pleased to have that partnership with PlexPod and overall has been very well received. Then just some overall community photos. I don't have any before photos. I did see some questions about that in the chat, um, but I'm sure we can we can provide those. But these are kind of after photos of our amenity areas um, from the lounge to the turf room, which John mentioned was originally a bank vault. Um, so very, very cool feature to have within the building, pet spa area. And then our fitness center, rock climbing wall, basketball court and pickleball court, which as you can imagine are used quite often. Um, you know, there's no weather permitting for these amenities. They're open 24 seven for our PlexPod members and FlashCube residents. And then just some photos of the interior of the apartments um, with the finishes, just to kind of give you an idea there. And again, the, the windows, that's, that's what we're known for is the beautiful views when you live in a building that is a cube of glass. Um, there's not a bad view. So no matter where you are, you've got a great view, whether it's uh, to the north, east, south or west, you've got a great view. So contact information here and we'll share that. You can obviously get us through our website as well. Um, and that concludes the slideshow on my end. I think that that wraps it up for us. Um, if there's any questions, happy to answer that. And other than that, we're we're excited to be here and again to share the information. Thank you for uh, joy, having us join. Very good. Th thank you so much. Uh, what a cool project. Uh, um, I was I couldn't help but it's, I was looking at some of the photos there, the recreation area and the and the, the indoor soccer. Uh, you had padding on the walls for pickleball and and uh, basketball, but I didn't see any for the soccer. So it must uh, must really have to be brave to uh, those must be. <laughs> hardcore hardcore matches that go on so good stuff there are some questions so i tried to jot those down as they were rolling through so let me see if i can capture um brandon asked if uh since this, the nature of the project historic renovation tax credits involved uh, were, were tax credits required uh to construct any affordable uh, housing units with this project Yes, we did have to um, offer um, a percentage of units at an affordable rate. What what percent was that? Oh, John, I don't know. I think I want to say it was. I think it was a. I believe it was five percent. I'd have to. I'd have to look back in my documents, but I think that's pretty close. Very good. And I see there was a question uh, kind of tied to that about what what some of the rent rent rent, rent range is, and Victoria has put in there. Uh, the market rents, uh, 1100 to, to 3100 And it was really uh, interesting to hear that you, the three bedroom option is uh, clearly unique. I, I know uh, 
we're empty nesters and just helped our daughter uh, search for an apartment in Kansas City and and pretty much uh, looking for the urban area near her place of work and uh, uh, two bedrooms was the max really that we found anywhere so that's a really unique option. Um, Uh, let's see, I think some of these have been covered in uh, answered questions and answers have been covered in a lot of these in the chat. We have a very proactive audience, so I love that. Uh, um, I am curious, though, you mentioned PlexPod is a partner, so uh, uh, co-working space that's available to all the, the uh, residents, the tenants. Are there any other non-residential uses besides PlexPod uh, that are part of Flash Cube, and and if not, would are any plan to make it more maybe kind of a multi-use type? Uh, right now, Plexpod is kind of the main partnership and um, co-working space. Um, they do take up the um, all of the kind of common area space on the main level and lower level. Um, we find that it's it's been that it's been very successful for, for our residents, but also non-residents um, PlexPod members in general. So they have seen kind of an uptick in their um, memberships as well as, as we've kind of come out of COVID and people are ready to get back and maybe they're working remotely, um, but they still want an office space um, and kind of having that as an option has been, has been ideal. Very good. Um, this may be a question for John and this will be the engineer in me, but uh, you talked about the uh, the steam system, the existing steam system, um, to uh, to create energy efficiency for for the for the structure. Um, and I'm interested to to hear a little bit more about that. I I, I hesitate to bring up maybe a, a competitive project, but I had the opportunity to tour Second in Delaware a few weeks ago, uh, which is new construction in the river market, but also uh, really champions energy efficiency, primarily through uh, insulation and, and materials, new new construction. I'm curious to kind of know maybe some of the engineering and design behind how you retrofit maybe steam, an old steam system to, to provide uh, heating and cooling for a new building. And maybe talk to, talk to that a little bit. Sure, yeah, uh, it was, uh, certainly uh, a challenge, uh, you know, and, and the retrofitting part, we were, when we went into it, we were hopeful that there was more retrofit than new. And uh, as we worked through it, uh, as you always do with an existing building, uh, you uncover more things than you, sometimes than you hope to find. Uh, like, you know, say, you know, initially you think, oh, all these all these vertical pipes, they're, they're going to be in good shape. And then when you start opening walls up and start inspect, and, you know, doing very thorough uh, investigations on these pipes, uh, you find, oh, well, some of these pipes really can't be reused. And, uh, you know, the ability for the, the contractor and the ownership and the design team to be able to pivot and to problem solve was critical along the way. So, um, so really much of the system uh, is really a lot of it ended up being uh, new. Uh, there's not, you know, we we ended up putting a lot of uh, a lot of new piping in to to service. So, uh, and then all the equipment. That was one thing that was was great about the partnership with Vicinity was uh, I believe they provided a lot of that rather large equipment that was in the basement. You know, it, uh, if you'd ever seen that boiler room back before we started construction, it was you know, two large, very, very rusty uh, boilers down there. And the, the equipment was was pretty rough. Uh, so that all had to get taken out and put in with, you know, modern brand new equipment with, you know, new piping, you know, sized appropriately for all this new equipment. Um, it certainly made, uh, it was challenging. The basement was, was one of the hardest areas for us to work around because very large pipes large equipment uh, and how to get everything to work and still be able to use the space. So it was certainly a challenge taking going from a, a, an office building to apartments was, was challenging. But so then all, all of, back to kind of the engineering side, all the 
the pipes run up through the building and then there's a kind of a circuit of pipes on each floor that serve each apartment has their own uh, mechanical unit that controls you know the heat and heating and cooling temperature in each floor um, but you know with with that hot and cold water running through the pipes uh, it's just it's a very it's unique. It's something. It's a kind of system that I haven't worked on before in my life. That was one thing I was really excited about was was getting uh, some exposure to this. Even you know, though I'm the architect, not the engineer, uh, getting the exposure to this system was was great. And is that hopefully that answers downtown? What's that? But are there other buildings? You know, new buildings in downtown that also incorporate that old technology, as it were. Or is this rather unique? That surprisingly, there's a lot of steam downtown. I don't know how many new buildings have the steam, but you know, before getting involved with this project, I didn't realize the network of steam pipe downtown. Um, and then as we work through with vicinity, you know, come to find a lot of the buildings still utilized uh, the, the steam system. And, and if anybody, you know, if, if people, uh, traversed this area much during construction and saw streets being torn up. A lot of that was due to vicinity replacing uh, their steam lines, their their network and expanding and and uh, growing their network even further downtown. So, if I can interject, my name is Jim Miller. I'm with Vicinity Energy. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, um, the Flash Cube is a, is an amazing project. Very sustainable. Uh, the uh, the condensate from the steam is used to uh, to run a gray water system for the building. Um, we have a lot of new construction that we've done. We 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 provide uh, all the steam and chilled water for the uh, the new Lowe's Convention Hotel. Many of the largest buildings downtown utilize our steam and chilled water. So that's in a short. Uh, uh, short description of what we do, and there there is a grid of pipes that run throughout the central business district, and a few other places across 670 and uh, up to Truman Hospital, and then to the east to Cargill. So, thank you for sharing yeah. that. You bet. Yeah, appreciate that uh, that information, and uh, uh, also love the background. So, oh. <laughs> Coming to you from Rome. Yes, yes. We appreciate you joining us across, Thank you. across time zones. <laughs> you know, speaking then of, uh, you know, old technology uh, modernized, uh, Flash Cube uh, is also located uh, along the streetcar route. And um, I'm just curious uh, in terms of uh, planning that went into this, uh, what, what, what factor did the streetcar play into, into your, into, into the old team's overall thinking? Well, I, I know that that was uh, a big driver. I, I know it played a big role, uh, and Haley, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this, it played a big role in them purchasing this building for redevelopment. You know, that, that coupled with uh, the historic tax credits uh, really made this location very, very appealing uh, to them. So yeah, the, and and being having a stop right in front of the building, I, I I can't say you're you can have a better location than that. So very good. You know, we've we've had the, uh, the privilege of having Tom Jarrett Jaron join us in the past, and talking about kind of big picture. You know, the impact of streetcar on development downtown and of course we're also starting to see you know positive impacts even just from the planned expansion further south on the uh, uh, properties in the midtown area so uh, it doesn't surprise me to hear that but I, it was interesting then to have it confirmed that that knowing streetcar was was going to happen uh, uh help determine the buyers to go ahead and proceed with this project yeah Sharing that. Any, anything more to add on that, Haley, as far as the background? No, I think I think John covered it really well and kind of hit all the the highlights and exciting points. Um, yeah, so I think we've covered it all. Very, very good. Uh, there is Cynthia asked a question, and it's one that I was curious about too, uh, given kind of a, my recent uh, introduction to the apartment uh, market in Kansas City. But what what's the current uh, occupancy occupancy rate at 
the flash queue? Yeah, we're currently at 85% occupied. Very good. Well, are there any other questions? Have I missed any questions in, in the chat? If so, uh, just shout out, let me know. And uh, otherwise, I want to, uh, to thank you all for joining us today. I, I, somebody added a comment, not a question so much, but there was a comment uh, about just uh, what a visual striking feature the, 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 uh, the structure is to downtown. I, I, I took advantage, I was in the area yesterday and, and made a few uh, laps driving around the building. And uh, uh, it was almost a driving hazard because I found myself just mesmerized by the reflection. And there's something to the fact that you're at the north end of downtown, open to, to I-70 there on the north. So you've got kind of some wide open vistas that really capture some very unique uh, uh, reflections. So I know a lot of that is, is luck, but a lot of that based on location, but a lot of it also is, is planning and it's, uh, uh, really cool to to know that uh, buildings of that vintage uh, that have that 70s vibe, I think you said earlier, uh, well, that makes me feel a little, little bit old myself, but I also think it's cool that we're embracing that that history. And I don't know, we, we had mid, mid-century, you know, to describe uh, architecture uh, previously. Is there a new term, John, that the architecture is saying for this, for this next modern uh, uh, type of uh, restoration. I, I, I've heard the term modern historic, um, but I'm not sure if that will stick. I think we're still kind of new to them kind of figuring out how they want to refer to this. So, but that's, that's one term I've heard. M modern historic. I, I like yeah. that. Uh, with emphasis on the modern, at least for, for my own generation. Uh, <laughs> Kate uh, Marshall asked a question here. Maybe this will be great to close out, but uh, how often do, do any of you uh, encounter folks who have never heard of a flash cube? Do you have to actually explain <laughs> what that is? Sometimes I have to do that with my kids with a phone book. I have to explain that, but, but do you actually have to say, well, you, you mentioned Kodak and young people today, as we old folks say, uh, they know what that is. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll speak to that a little. I just had it happen this week. I had a um, a young man in with his mom looking around his first apartment and he said, what a cool name. And his mom said to him, do you know what that means? Like, do you know what that comes from? <laughs> he explained it to him. So it does happen often. Um, a lot of times we do get the like, you know, well, what a what a unique name, you know, and then we go into explain what it is. Often I've thought about putting a, a vintage camera with a cube, you know, right up front as just a point of reference, because it certainly does when you look at it, you you certainly look at it and go, oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, it looks just like the building. Yeah, we as a as a design team, we embraced it so much from from the early days that we even thought, you know, if they ever wanted to do a, a ride share program, they could they could purchase uh, the Nissan Cube uh, and have that be their their vehicle of choice. Just tie it all together. So. Oh, very good. Very good. So, well, Haley. John, Victoria, thank you all so much for being with us today, for sharing that story. Um, uh, we talked a little bit earlier, uh, love seeing the, the new photos. Uh, I know Lisa Shackelford, our good friend from Metro Wire Media is on covering this for, for that publication. And if we could get her maybe some before and after uh, uh, photos that she could include in the, the news article they're gonna write about it, that would be great. Um, well, I tell you, there is one more question that just came in and we still have a few minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, Justin Short asks, can you speak to the reconstruction of the floors? I.e., I know it was difficult to convert from office to multifamily. Yes, uh, so uh, one of the challenging parts of that is, is the uh, code required uh, sound, uh, kind of the sound barrier, I, kind of put it in kind of simple terms it, between apartments. Uh, you know, when you're building new walls between each apartment, that's easy. It's the floors. Uh, so these are 
the, the floors are six inch concrete floors, uh, which helps, but uh, that's not going to get you all the way there. So there's uh, a pretty, uh, a rather expensive ceiling system below every one of those uh, concrete slabs. So there's uh, a lot of sound absorbing material between that concrete floor and the ceiling below uh, to the point of uh, had a lot of uh, painful conversations about how much that ceiling was going to really cost, but there was a reason we were doing it. And um, after some guidance, I think everybody eventually got on board. Uh, but yeah, it was, that was something challenging even from our standpoint is trying to find something that was going to um, be fairly easy enough to build uh, somewhat economical, but really, uh, give that sound criteria that we really needed to meet and actually go well above it. So uh, kudos to ownership for buying into that and uh, and understanding the need to have a good and a sound barrier between your neighbors above and below. Oh, very, very good. Uh, thank you. I think there was a question also about the heated pa uh, plaza space. So there's uh, part of the construction was that all those brick pavers out in front of the building were removed and reinstalled. Uh, part of that was to make sure that the waterproofing, that, that we were never going to get water below, you know, through that patio down into the space below, uh, put in a little bit of drainage system uh, incorporated into that. And then while we had it open, we thought, well, why don't we incorporate a, a heating system below the brick so when it's really cold and snowy outside, they can turn that system on and there's a path from the front door to the, the sidewalk and then a, a small path that leads from that over to the uh, parking lot. So residents have a much clearer path uh, to get out. And we all know what a Kansas City winter can be like, so it's... Uh, nice little benefit for residents to when they're coming and going and maintenance i'll add they love that they don't yes. have to do that snow removal so that's uh, yeah. it works for everyone yep oh, very cool uh and so there is one final well i'll say one final question here because i think it uh, it's a perfect uh, one to end on uh, since cynthia heron asks if there are any future projects on the horizon and would you do anything different based on what you've learned from FlashCube? I'll let Haley answer about the future projects. <laughs> but um, you go ahead, Haley. I'll let you answer that oh, one first. I was, there, you know, Worcester Communities is continually growing, so always future projects in the works um, all over the city. So downtown to Green Valley, Blue Springs, Wichita, we're kind of stretching in all directions, new development and redevelopment. And then would I, would I do anything different? Um, given all of our constraints, probably not. I, I, there were things that, you know, there are a lot of, as, as an architect and as developers, you, ha you have to balance a lot of different things. And, you know, if I was living in a, an architect bubble, I would have maybe done maybe fewer apartments, but that wasn't what the client needed. The client, you know, Wooster needed, you know, more apartments. So it just made us work a little harder to get, you know, to maximize that footprint with apartments and, and good apartments. So uh, it, that was a challenge. Uh, there are a number of spaces. So there's a lot of things that we have no control over. Um, you know, you, you wish that, you uh, you know, budgets were unlimited, but we all know that that's not real, real world. So uh, in the end, I, you know, I've, I've had, it's been open for a while, so I've had time to think about it. And I think uh, given everything that we went through, I, I can't say that I would, there's anything really significant that I would go back and change. Fantastic. Well, this has been a great, great story to, 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 to learn about today. Thank you so much for sharing it. Uh, I've always been curious about, you know, that building and, and now I'm, I'm curious to kind of see, see the inside of it, to be honest with you. So uh, uh, I want Haley, John, Victoria, thank you all so much. Thank you to uh, our friends at, uh, at Blue Sky for sponsoring 
uh, thank you for uh, Amethyst Place for sharing that story. And uh, with that, we're close to one. Uh, we'll let you all go and enjoy your day and hopefully see you again uh, on the second Wednesday of November, November the 10th. Uh, stay attention, stay tuned to social media, our website, and your uh, email blast for information about the November program. So th thank you all again and, and have a great day.